Hello everyone and welcome to Amanpour & Company. Here's what's coming up. America is back, ready to lead the world, not retreat from it. President-elect Joe Biden promises to restore America's global leadership. But how does the rest of the world feel about that? A look ahead with foreign policy commentator Peter Beinart and former Pentagon official Corey Shaki. Then... Uh, the first vaccine delivery to New York will be 170,000. The COVID cavalry is on the way to New York. But as hospitalizations rise there, I asked New York Mayor Bill de Blasio if the worst is still to come. And Do you think that maybe Joe Biden has John Kerry and Al Gore like in this like a speed dial in his phone and actually just hit the wrong one? <laughs> like they're like <laughs> uh, Hari Srinivasan speaks to comedians W. Kamau Bell and Hari Kondabolu about their irreverent new podcast, Politically Reactive. Almond Poor and Company is made possible by the Anderson Family Fund, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Candace King Weir, the Strauss Family Foundation, Bernard and Denise Schwartz, Charles Rosenblum, Jeffrey Katz, and Beth Rogers. Additional support provided by these funders and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiana Manpour in London. President-elect Biden has a clear and consistent message on foreign policy. The United States is back at the head of the table. This after four years of Donald Trump's disruptive America First wrecking ball. Biden says he's been getting support for this vision from all of the world leaders who he's been speaking to since the election. I've been struck by how much they're looking forward to the United States reasserting its historic role as a global leader, both in the Pacific as well as the Atlantic, all across the world. But while many world leaders may welcome a restoration of stable U.S. policy under Biden, does his vision of America as the world's policeman or even its moral leader fit anymore? In other words, should America lead, partner, or get out of the way? Foreign policy analyst Peter Beinart raises this very question in a column for The New York Times. It's called, Biden wants America to lead the world, it shouldn't. And joining him is Corey Shake, a former official at both the Defense and State Departments. She's a Republican who's advised traditionalists like John McCain in the 2008 presidential campaign. Welcome to both of you. Let me first ask you to set up your thesis, Peter, which runs contrary, obviously, to the president-elect and many of the leaders anyway over here in the alliance. You're saying that the idea of leadership is almost a misnomer, uh, misunderstood, and potentially even dangerous. Why do you say that about America? So first, I think you have to define the word leadership. It doesn't just mean motherhood and apple pie. It means being in charge. Uh, Joe Biden himself said it means being at the head of the table. I think the United States needs to be at the table, but not necessarily at the head of the table. First of all, the United States doesn't wield anywhere near the relative power that we did uh, in the at the at the beginning of the Cold War, back then our our GDP was about half of the world's GDP. It's now about one seventh. By many metrics, China already has a larger GDP, and that gap is likely to grow. So it's first unrealistic. Secondly, it's not what most Americans want. It reflects a real gap between foreign policy elites and the American people. Poll after poll shows that Americans want America to be engaged in the world, but in a shared partnership. They specifically reject the notion of American leadership in favor of partnership. And finally, we have to ask ourselves, as Americans, hard questions about whether we've earned the moral right to claim that we are leaders. We're the only country that left the, the Paris Climate Change Agreement. We left the WHO in the middle of a pandemic. The, we have turned, we have, the Trump administration has wrecked the World Trade Organization. And even before the Trump administration, our post 9 11 wars had created by one estimate 37 million refugees. I think we need a little bit of humility. We can be part of the solution, but we have not earned the right, nor do we have the power to be in charge. So that is that is a lot a lot there, and I just want to ask you, Corey Shaki, having been in um, you know the rooms where it happens, so to speak, in the Defense Department, in the State Department, advising presidential candidates on a more traditionalist foreign policy, 
Should America be at the table and not at the head of the table? What kind of difference would that make? It would make an enormous difference because being at the table, being just one of many, is not sufficient to sustain the existing order against the challenges that are being pushed forward by China and by others. There's a reason that the countries that have the policies that Peter is advocating for the United States, those are the very countries that desperately want to return to American leadership because they understand that unless the United States gathers around us like-minded countries to establish and enforce the rules, somebody else will, and you will like those rules a lot less then you will like the rules that the United States and its friends created out of the ashes of World War II. But, but just quickly before I turn it back to Peter, what about this notion that it's true, you know, not a majority of the American people, I don't know what the actual number is, but, you know, polls of me going on for a long time, they want a major role, but not the leading role. That's for the, that's, you know, the popular view. And then, you know, the idea that America is not as, let's say, economically strong as it used to be when it could wield a huge amount of power. What about those issues? So in, I don't think polls of big general questions like should America lead or participate are nearly as instructive as specific polls. Do you think the government of China should be able to put a million of its citizens in concentration camps? Or do you think the United States should organize other countries to oppose that? I think you would get an overwhelming American support for that because the values that undergird the American system, Americans believe are universal and our friends believe they are universal. And we want an international order that helps uh, advance individual human rights and human dignity and human opportunity. And if you ask the question that way, you actually get an enormous amount of American support. And on the second question, which is uh, that the United States isn't as powerful relatively as it was in 1945, that's certainly true. But you don't need as much power to sustain a positive order as you needed to establish it. And moreover, it's true that the United States all by itself is only roughly 20% of GDP globally. But if you add up the European Union, Mexico, Canada, Australia, Japan, South Korea, the countries that share America's vision of the international order and support America's vision of the international order, you're well over two thirds of international global power. So Peter, you know, I want to put to you Let's just quote what um, Secretary of State nominee Antony Blinken said. Whether we like it or not, the world simply does not organize itself. And I guess we have kind of seen that America has been at the table and not leading and at the head of the table for four years under President Trump. And, you know, a lot of allies and a lot of analysts sort of bemoaned the fact that, for instance, let's just take the COVID pandemic, America's traditional leadership role in gathering a coalition and actually organizing its way and the world's way out of something like this, which has been seen in the past, whether it's Ebola, the financial crisis, et cetera, you know, has led us to where we are right now. Do you not see that kind of organizing role that actually only America can do? I think America can be part of playing that role, but I think the problem with the vision that Corey Shockey laid out, as, as sincere and earnest and well-meaning as it clearly is, is that it is based on a deeply naive understanding of how the United States is actually be conducting itself. In many ways, it is the United States that has been the greatest wrecking ball for these principles of liberal international order that we claim to advance. It is the United States that has repeatedly gone to war, invaded other countries without the imprimatur of international law. It is uh, it is the United States that has that that has um, that has that has taken upon itself the right 
with to, to essentially extrajudicially kill people through donor tax across the world, across the Middle East, and more recently, uh, assassinate uh, the, uh, the a major official of a foreign country. The United States has repeatedly interfered in foreign elections. So I think the United States has the capacity to do great good around the world. But I think the reason in my piece, I quote Martin Luther King speaking in 1967, when he calls America the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. I'm not talking about inside the country. Obviously, China is far more repressive than we are internally. But I think when we think about our role externally, the harm that we have done to the liberal rules-based international order that foreign policy elites claim to support by leaving the Iran deal, by leaving the Paris Climate Accord, by our wars that have produced so much devastation, we need to be a little bit more humble and think a little bit more as doctors do about being Hippocratic. First, do no harm. Corey, I mean, there is, you know, quite a lot of facts and truth to that. What do you say about, for instance, the U.S. not being part of the ICC, which is the International Criminal Court, um, the whole business about, um, you know, you know what, what Peter was just saying, drones, and the post-9-11 policy that actually has created quite a lot of, of pushback around the world for U.S. quote-unquote mm -hmm. leadership? Yes, I think the United States very often makes bad choices. The reason that so many countries still want the United States to be the organizer and the dominant power in the international order is because the alternatives are worse, right? Think about Zambia, a country that has just defaulted on its international loans. They just appealed for American and international help because the government of China is trying to break the existing rules of order and force uh, priority repayment to Chinese state-owned companies. That would prevent Zambia from being able to get future loans if they don't treat all uh, debtors equally. So it's those kinds of rules that the United States has established where we didn't wring the maximum amount of advantage for ourselves. We, we put forward rules that worked to the security and the prosperity of the majority of countries. And that's why, despite our mistakes, so many of America's friends around the world and so many countries that benefit from the existing order really want the United States to step back into its traditional role, despite our mistakes. So let's just... Uh, yeah, go ahead, Peter, because yeah. I want to play a little bit of an interview I just did with um, the, the head of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, who, who said the same thing. I mean, obviously, NATO was President Trump's favorite wrecking ball, or rather punching bag, and many in Europe were afraid that a second Trump term might see the U.S. pulled out of NATO altogether. Just want to play this, and then I'll get your reaction. For me, the most important thing is that uh, we need uh, to have the United States and Canada present in Europe. Um, of course, I welcome EU efforts on defense, but EU can never uh, defend uh, Europe. 80% uh, of NATO's ex defense expenditure are coming from non-EU allies. For instance, the United States, Canada, Britain, etc. And let's not forget that NATO always says the only time Article 5 has ever been invoked, you know, all for one, one for all, was for the United States, by all the other countries after 9-11. I mean, Peter, there, there are areas like, like America's superiority in, in lift and uh, you know, all, all those sort of logistic abilities that it has that you know, the world would be pretty much, or at least the alliance, would be pretty much worse off without. Wouldn't you agree? Sure, I am not arguing that the United States should not play a significant role in trying to solve common problems. To the contrary, I mean, if you, uh, uh, I think the United States should be doing that, but I think we need to try to do that with, with an honest appraisal of how we have actually behaved. And rather than creating a kind of, uh, uh, rather than, than, than being naive about our own role, let's just talk about, talk about what Corey was talking about, about China's Belt and Road Initiative. China has gone all over the world and given countries capital to develop because they wanted it. 
and because it was not available from the United States and at the same level. And yes, there have been abuses, certainly, but if you talk to people in Africa, for goodness sakes, and other parts of the world about, about their experience with aid from the IMF, with institutions dominated by the United States, I think you will not see this vision of that the United States has been pure and China in its external behaviors has been has been malevolent. In fact, that the Asian Development Bank and some of the other institutions that China has created have actually been very helpful in getting other countries global capital. The United States has a very important and valuable role to play. What I'm trying to argue against is this assumption that we are on the side of the angels and that anything we do bad might just be a mistake and exception to the norm. And I think if you actually look at the way people in the rest of the world look at the United States, they tend to have a much less Disneyland perspective on us than we sometimes do. Um, I just want to put up a little graphic that we have, which shows um, over a period of, of some 20 years, the Pew Research numbers of countries and their uh, favorable or otherwise view of the United States. And it does show a pretty precipitous drop um, over the last 20 years, since the year 2000. Corey, though, I, I want to ask you something, and this is quite interesting, because the United States, certainly in its um, dealings with China, uh, has always said, anyway, that it will play the human rights card, that human rights, wherever, is a central plank in the US uh, foreign policy, and a defense of democracy and freedom and, 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 and the other key values. It is interesting to hear, and I'm sure you've been reading as well, quite a lot of Chinese opposition figures, Hong Kong opposition figures, elsewhere also in Asia, who believe that actually Trump's disruptiveness, his unorthodoxy, the way he barrels into you know, Xi Jinping or whoever else, is more effective or could be more destabilizing for these autocrats than the tried and tested policy as usual, human rights um, uh, of a Biden or, or the Democrats. How do you work that out? Were you surprised by, by those kinds of, of, I don't know, conclusions out there? I wasn't surprised because what dissidents value about the Trump administration is that it, for the first time, said China is a malevolent actor internationally and domestically, and the United States needs to push back against that. I think dissidents within China very much valued that. They would have also preferred that the United States acted in concert with allies, worked together to create a common trade front against China. So the Trump administration understood that China's behavior was growing uh, darker and darker, more dangerous, both domestically and internationally. And it took a stronger line than previous American administrations had. But China's behavior was growing increasingly malevolent, which is why. So I think what dissidents in China and Hong Kong and other places would like to see is the United States rightly organizing other countries leading other countries to take a common front against what China is trying to do to corrode and undercut the existing international order and to create a space beyond which no one in the international community has a right to say or advocate for human rights and individual liberties. Mm. Um, right, but finally to you, Peter, yeah? I just wanted to say, absolutely, what China is doing in, in Hong Kong and Xinjiang is horrific. We should stand with those dissidents. But we actually have more power to do things about the oppression of dissidents in countries that we fund, in countries where we sell arms. And if you look at those countries, if you look at Saudi Arabia or the UAE or Bahrain, or you look at Palestinians living in Gaza, which the UN has said is now unlivable by human beings, uh, which receives $3 billion of US aid a year, I would say that the moral responsibility starts with the places where we have the most power to actually do something about the oppression of those dissidents. And we have not been doing a very good job. OK, last word to you then, um, uh, Corey, because very briefly, you've also been seeing um, stories about Russia and President Putin, how he has not uh, you know, rushed to the defense, for instance, of Alexander Lukashenko after that fraudulent election uh, in terms of the results, how he has actually played the mediator and the peacemaker in the very vicious fight between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh. 
what what do you how do you analyze what he's doing and particularly as we know i guess he he still aims to sort of undercut the us and western alliances and institutions yeah putin's playing a weak and weakening hand very adroitly by moving into uh, to dominate situations like in Syria, like in Nagorno-Karabakh, where the United States is doing exactly what Peter advocates, which is just being one of the countries participating instead of taking a leading role to identify a good solution and organizing other countries to help contribute to a good solution. So Putin's taking advantage of where we are doing what Peter is advocating for the United States to do. Well, we're going to have four years to assess the uh, incoming administration, and we'll be talking to you um, as that gets underway. Corey Shaka, Peter Beinart, thank you so much indeed for joining us. And right now, we're getting word of actually a happy update and perhaps uh, an example of what international pressure can do. On Tuesday, we brought you the story of Karim Enara and two of his human rights colleagues in Egypt who were arrested there on trumped up terrorism charges for meeting with a dozen Western diplomats. Now, according to the head of their organization, Hossam Bagat, all three men have been released. This, as I say, after a major international outcry over their arrest and, of course, an outcry over Egypt's continuing crackdown on civil society. Next, we turn to leadership inside the United States, and yet another shocking coronavirus record has now been set. Over 100,000 Americans now find themselves in a hospital bed. And with COVID deaths also at an all-time high, infectious disease expert and member of Biden's COVID advisory board, Michael Osterholm, has a harsh warning. Right now, we have stretched our healthcare worker staff as far as we can. And it will get to the point where the quality of care will uh, be severely uh, hampered uh, if, in fact, we don't have these health care workers. So you may get a bed in a hospital, but will you get the kind of trained health care workers that can care for you? That's certainly very troubling, but hope may be on the horizon as the United States gets ready to roll out its vaccine in a matter of weeks. Bill de Blasio is mayor of New York City, where there is a worrisome rise in hospitalizations, and he's joining me now from there. Uh, mayor de Blasio, welcome to the program. Uh, these are really terrible numbers that we're hearing, and it's uh, all over the country, including some dangerous spikes in, in your own city and state. What can you tell us about the state of affairs um, right now, particularly in hospitalizations? Uh, Christian, we have seen uh, certainly an increase in hospitalizations, although uh, less than we expected to date uh, and with less severity in the sense of the impact on our intensive care units. So we are very concerned. Uh, the quote you just ran uh, certainly typifies what I'm feeling, the concern about hospital capacity, hospital staff, what happens if the numbers start to go up abruptly. But to date, what we have seen is still a manageable situation in our hospitals. We still have capacity and much better approaches to COVID patients that have led to better outcomes by far than what we experienced in uh, the early spring. So, so let me ask you, you know, you say so far it's manageable unless something terrible happens. We're seeing terrible things happen, you know, elsewhere. The mayor of Los Angeles is basically telling everybody just to stay put. Don't leave the house unless for absolute emergencies. So things are, are really bad in parts of the country. What kind of procedures are you putting in place to avoid any, you know, the worst, the worst case scenario? We obviously were the epicenter of this crisis, so we learned uh, to do a lot of things differently. And our hospitals have approached the situation very differently in terms of space and staffing and strategies. And again, we're seeing better outcomes, but we're preparing right now for the danger of a real increase. We're also, we've put out a health department order telling New Yorkers who are over 65 years old or who have pre-existing conditions like diabetes or heart disease to stay home and only go out for the most essential needs, like a doctor appointment. Uh, so we are starting up that ladder. Uh, we are working with the state of New York on if additional uh, restrictions will be needed. But I do want to note at the same time that we have seen, uh, thankfully, 
a high level of mask usage by New Yorkers, a lot of adherence to rules, bluntly, much more so than in some other parts of the United States. And that is having some effect. Certainly, our hospital teams report that being one of the reasons they don't see the same intensity is because New Yorkers have been very conscientious about mask wearing, and that has had an impact on the trajectory of the disease here. Let, let me ask you about vaccines, because the whole world is talking about it right now. As you know, um, this country, the United Kingdom, gave its approval, becoming the first for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and it'll start rolling it out next week. We understand we see Russia, Moscow, the mayor has said, next week they're starting. We see in major German cities. And now we hear your governor saying that 170,000 doses of a vaccine is coming to New York State. Um, I think in about I, I think in about ten days or just over a week. Tell me what you expect and how far that will go in New York City. We expect on December fifteenth, so twelve days from now, uh, the first major shipment from Pfizer. We are going to focus on the needs of our most vulnerable healthcare professionals, the real frontline workers uh, who need that vaccine to keep safe, so they can protect all of us. We're going to focus on nursing home. Uh, residents and staff. Uh, but that work is going to begin in about 12 days. We uh, think the number of doses is going to increase greatly over the next few weeks. So even in the month of December, Christian, we expect to have reached a lot of New Yorkers and the folks who need it the most. We're then going to aggressively go into January with a focus on the neighborhoods that were hardest hit by COVID. We saw tremendous racial disparity, uh, particularly hard-hit uh, neighborhoods in black and Latino communities. As we get more and more doses, we are going to make sure that this does not end up being a situation, in effect, where the doses go to the highest bidder or the folks who are most privileged. We're going to focus on people who live in public housing and folks who are lower income and in the neighborhoods that have had the worst experience with COVID to make sure their most vulnerable uh, community members uh, get the vaccine early. So there was quite a dramatic statement from three former U.S. presidents, um, uh, Obama, Bush, and Clinton, who said that they would not only take it, but take it publicly, if necessary, on camera, to show people, um, as soon as it was approved, obviously, and as soon as Dr. Fauci signs off on it. Um, tell me about any concerns you might have about so-called vaccine hesitancy. In other words, would you do something like that? How will you persuade people to take this vaccine? One, I absolutely would, uh, when it's the appropriate time, I think it's really important for public officials to show that we believe in it. And this uh, set of vaccines coming from uh, major pharmaceutical companies with so much verification, so many checks and balances in place from different levels of healthcare leadership is something I truly believe we can trust. I honestly believe the fact that the Biden administration is coming in soon is going to increase the trust levels that might not have been there. Uh, with the vagaries of a Trump administration constantly commenting on the vaccine. So I think we're in a much better situation. I do think we're going to see distrust. There's an anti-vaxxer movement. We have to keep answering that with the health care facts. There's going to be a lot of concerns in communities of color. Again, who have borne the brunt and have a lot of questions, a lot of distrust towards government at this point. We're going to need local leaders, trusted community leaders, uh, activists, uh, faith leaders to join us in showing people they believe in the vaccine. This is going to be a grassroots effort. If we really expect it to take hold, it can't just be some government voices. It has to be from the grassroots. Tell me something. How troubling is it, in terms of relatively speaking, that you have these incidents? You had this mass wedding in a, an Orthodox community, um, I think, in, in Brooklyn. You've got this party at a mansion that was raided with 400 guests. You've got a bar or something in Staten Island where thousands of people just last night were out there, you know, hurling political epithets. There's, there's a huge political drama, and in some cases, as we're looking at this picture of the wedding, religious drama and arguments over freedom and sovereignty that are playing out in some quarters. How serious are they? They're serious, but you, I don't want to overrate how frequent they are. There is an ideological challenge. Let's be honest about that. And it unites several of the examples you've talked about. Uh, the Staten Island situation and some of what we've seen for sure in Brooklyn as well has an ideological basis. 
uh, uh, Trumpism and the message that mask wearing and restrictions should be uh, avoided or confronted. That is affecting the atmosphere here, but by no means is that the majority, Christian. It is mm -hmm. the vast majority of New Yorkers actually have been pretty extraordinary in their level of discipline and adherence to the rules. Uh, we obviously see some young people who you know, think they are impervious, and that's where some of the parties and gatherings are coming from. But uh, their fellow New Yorkers have quickly reported those situations, and they've been shut down quickly uh, by our public safety officers. So. It's not a widespread phenomenon. Uh, and it's certainly something I'm happy to say that the, the people across almost all demographics uh, are being consistent about the mask wearing in particular. You walk around New York City, it is by far the norm right now. Again, sadly, not the case in much of America. But this city went through such a troubling experience. And uh, there is a, a good communal reality in New York City where people watch out for each other. And they understand wearing that mask actually is about protecting everyone else around you and your own family. And we see, thank God, a lot of commitment to it. Can I ask you just quickly about the Supreme Court, which has decided to weigh in on some of the restrictions that the governor imposed on religious gatherings? I mean, you called this uh, Orthodox wedding and the mass gathering irresponsible. Um, the Supreme Court has reversed um, these restrictions on gatherings uh, in religious spaces. What, analyze that for me. How helpful, obviously, America is a country of religious freedom, but here you're in a massive pandemic where the com common good presumably trumps individual rights, I guess. How no, unhelpful or helpful is that? I, the Supreme Court decision makes our work harder unquestionably. And in fact, Justice Sotomayor, a, a New Yorker who knows the city, uh, led the dissent in saying that it's uh, really the role of local government to protect people's health and safety. And, and we have to be given that freedom to do that work in a federal system. But my simple analysis is this. You can have freedom uh, to worship, but also have smart restrictions on how many people should be in a building. I think the court mm -hmm overly complicated things by taking away the ability to strike that balance. And in fact, in the beginning of this a pandemic here in New York City, faith leaders across the board, to their great credit, told their own congregants, we're not going to have services to protect people. We're, we're closing down houses of worship. That went on for months in the city. So I, I want to be fair to faith communities that actually were willing to do that voluntarily. I think the court has made a huge mistake here because they could have uh, continued to reinforce religious freedom while also giving local authorities the ability to strike some balance. Uh, some of these restrictions are just common sense. You cannot have a house of worship full of people right. in the middle of a pandemic that it once again is raging. Okay, so let me ask you lastly, because schools is a big, big conundrum all over the world, including New York City, the biggest, the world's biggest public school system. Uh, you know, even Dr. Fauci said last week, close the bars and keep the schools open. You did order public schools sh shut down, I think, last week. You've reversed yourself to some extent. You've adjusted that um, in the aftermath. There are many studies that suggest that actually the virus is not transmitted as much in schools. Where are you going to come down on this? Because it seems to be this rolling crisis all over the city or the state, all over the country, and in many other parts of the world. We want to, with the new model we put in place, sustain our school system, keep it open until the vaccine is widely distributed in New York City. The previous model worked. I want to be fair. What we did starting in September uh, was extraordinarily safe. It was a gold standard of layered health and safety approaches. Every child, every adult wearing a mask, unlike almost any place else in the world, that was a requirement. Constant cleaning, social distancing. Uh, so many measures that worked. We had extraordinarily, level, extraordinarily low levels of coronavirus positivity in our schools. Uh, but we had said to parents, to educators, we would hold a very strict standard. And so we temporarily shut down. We've now come back with testing every single week, uh, the schools, kids, adults alike. And every child has to uh, consent to testing. The family has to consent to testing to be able to come to school. With those additional health and safety measures, we're convinced we can keep school open for the duration. Right now, it's the younger grades. Uh, it's from uh, pre-K up to fifth grade. We look forward in January and beyond opening up older grades as the healthcare situation improves. 
But, Christian, I really believe this has been a success story, that schools have proven, certainly in New York City, we've proven they can be the safest place in the whole city, in fact. Okay. So let me ask you what it's like to be mayor of such a city like New York. I mean, I'm sure any city in the United States, but New York is world famous. It's storied. You, you rely on tourism. You rely, you know, so much on stuff that's not able to happen right now, even the hospitality industry. What is it like for you personally? Well, thank you for asking. I would say, honestly, it's been incredibly difficult. Everyone understands that. And, and we're dealing with uh, such a moving target of an opponent here in the coronavirus. So the, the world doesn't understand it fully yet. The scientific community doesn't understand it. And we constantly have to adjust. But here's the, the big silver lining. New Yorkers, uh, famous for their strength, their toughness, have shown it again, fought back went from epicenter of the crisis to one of the safest places in the whole country in the course of a few months. They're fighting back again. They're participating. It gives me a lot of hope. Also, jobs have been coming back. You're absolutely right about the hospitality industry's very hard hit. Uh, but we've seen hundreds of thousands of jobs come back, thank God, since the spring. Uh, you go around New York City today, there's a lot of life out there. There's a lot of people working uh, to bring the city back right now. So I actually take heart from that. Uh, I can't wait for this crisis to be over. But I got to tell you, even in the worst moments, uh, there's like a, a civic heroism, uh, everyday heroism we saw among New Yorkers uh, that kept this place going. And uh, I, it inspires me. It really gives me energy to get to the end point when we can get this vaccine uh, to as many people as humanly possible. Yeah, we all want to see that. Mayor de Blasio, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. And it has been a rough roller coaster this year with public health and political crises all melded into one. Even so, our next guests believe that sometimes, sometimes all you can do to stay sane is laugh. Longtime friends W. Kamau Bell and Hari Kondabolu are comedians and writers, and together they host a podcast called Politically Reactive. Here they are talking to our Hari Srinivasan about what they call the dumpster fire that is American politics and the importance of affecting change. Christian, thanks. W. Kamau Bell and Hari Kondabolu, thank you both for being with us. Um, you have this new podcast out. Um, you're both stand-up comedians. You've done different types of comedy before. Um, during, what is the impetus about bringing back this podcast that you used to have four years ago but now, what do you do? Do you guys, like, meet in, you know, a Denny's parking lot in your parked cars and, like, record <laughs> this sort of close to each other? Honestly, uh, uh, Hari, uh, not my friend for 10 years. Uh, that's how I'll identify you. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, I, if we lived next door to each other, maybe this podcast wouldn't exist. A lot of this podcast is about two really good friends connecting. And then when we connect, we talk about politics. And we thought we put the podcast down for forever. But with the state of the world, you pay, you pay attention to the news. There's a lot going on. So the fans of the podcast were like, when are you coming back? Look at what's going on in the world, in this country. And so really, it was the fans and then the pandemic providing the time that really brought it back. I want to uh, take a look a little bit at kind of the state of politics today. And you have been commenting on this as well. But heading into the Biden administration now, it's not like there is one tent that is the Democrat party, that is the left, that is the progressive wing, there's still quite a bit of consternation on what direction Joe Biden's administration should take and how we get there. I mean, the grandparents have to get out of the way. I mean, that's what it feels <laughs> like. You know, no offense to Chuck Schumer and Dianne Feinstein and Nancy Pelosi and all the other folks that have been in charge for, for way too long. But there's another generation coming up and they're young and they're hungry and they're mobilizing. And it's just a sad state of affairs that I, I feel like they have more in common with moderate Republicans than they do with a, a segment of their base of young people of color, women of color, color members of the LGBTQ community. Like, I, it almost feels like they're more comfortable hanging out at cocktail parties with moderate Republicans and doing the business of Washington versus the business of justice. And so, yeah, I think there's a generation shift, and I, I think that they're trying to hold on to what they had, and they're getting in the way of, of, of the future I really see happening. 
come out, the comeback to that is going to be, look, 70, 72 million people voted for the other guy, that there is still a big gap between the type of America that Hari is describing and the America that we might have today. Uh, yeah, you make a good point. Maybe we should be two separate countries. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that the thing that honestly is happening in America, we are never as progressive as we think we are. We're never as good as we think we are. And if you look at the history of the country, it's about trending in more progressive and inclusive directions. Doesn't always happen at the, as fast as you want it to. Sometimes there's two step forwards, so you get one step back. But we are always moving in a more progressive, inclusive, kinder direction. And so I think that if you look at the history of this country, which is luckily we're a pretty young country, it's not that long, you can see that's the way it is. And even when things that aren't quote unquote popular, sometimes they are just correct. For example, uh, marriage equality was made the law of the land before the entire country was on board with that. And a lot of the country still not on board with that doesn't mean that marriage equality should not be the law of the land. Uh, I always say that if slavery had been a referendum that we voted on, I might not be free to sit here and talk to you two right now. So there are things that are correct. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily popular in the time that they're correct. You know, also like the idea of uh, equality and justice and, and freedom, um, those aren't things that you can take moderate opinions on. Because eventually, like Kamau was saying, we move in the direction of progress and what was what is progressive now ends up being seen as the status quo later. So, you know, we're just saying, let's get to that faster as opposed to like this piecemeal justice and freedom over several centuries that none of us can enjoy. Uh, Hari, you were mentioning on a recent podcast about the idea that we're always asking progressives to quickly endorse the dominant candidate, but that that's, you gotta wonder why, what's in it for them to do that when ultimately the result is to water things down once you get into office. Honestly, it, it, it angers me to no end because that, that is always the call. How come, how come Bernie Sanders didn't uh, support Hillary soon enough, endorse her soon enough? How come Liz Warren didn't support Joe Biden? How come uh, Sanders didn't support Joe Biden immediately? It, it's like, well, then what's in it for the progressive left? Because what's going to end up happening is that we're supposed to be good soldiers, right, and support uh, the, the, candidate of, you know, the candidate of the Democratic Party, and then the candidate gets elected and forgets us. I mean, John Kerry is currently the climate envoy. Like, no offense to John Kerry, but was he this big environmentalist all these years? <laughs> I don't remember, like Al Gore at least, it's like, okay, it's, it's a bit of a mainstream choice, but fine. John Kerry never really made this as, as this wasn't part of what he was using it, you know, this wasn't what he was saying on his pulpit, that's what I'm saying. And so it's ridiculous that all these environmentalists all these young people who are driven to save the planet and you choose someone that nobody has seen work on these issues. Actually, I just thought of something, uh, Hari K. Do you think that maybe Joe Biden has John Kerry and Al Gore like in, this, in like a speed dial in his phone and actually just hit the wrong one? <laughs> like they're like, <laughs> like, oh, John, yeah. Oh, man. I mean, he, I mean, he definitely, he doesn't have that issue with John Edwards, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he That's, probably deleted him a while ago. You know, so uh, Harry, you know, one of the uh, critiques generally of the left is that uh, the left circles their wagons and they shoot each other. The right circles the wagons and they take all comers, right? It's that there, it is such a, a, a broad consortium, a big tent. Our other Brown brother, Hassan Minaj, had a Patriot Act episode that talked about how the right essentially has, uh, the left has the Denny's menu, which is all things for all people, not necessarily any of them are tasty. And the right has the Chipotle menu. It's like, we got these eight things. And if you were one of these eight things, you better show up and have a great time. But if you're not, go somewhere else, right? So how, how do we reconcile this uh, in, in the interest of trying to go forward as a country? And as you said, um, you know, don't kowtow to the, the moderates or the extremes on the other side. I mean, it really is about what the party stands for. If you stand for certain values, they're, you know, are you, how much are you willing to compromise? Because ultimately when you compromise on values regarding justice and, and equal rights and human dignity, you're sacrificing someone else's human rights and human dignity, right? That's where the compromise really lies. And so, you know, to me, it's like, what does this party stand for? And if you're a party that really stands for these values, you can't constantly moderate them because they're, they're not your rights to moderate. 
I think it's about the thing you said about like new people in positions of power. We had Cori Bush in our podcast when she was still running for her uh, seat and now she has won her seat and she's a young black woman from from uh, Missouri who was homeless, has been an activist, has got, lived a really hard life and now she's a congressperson who's now in a position of power. And I think the more people like that you get in there who are actual real people who have come from being activists and come from doing the work to get in there to do the work, the more this these conversations about how we do it change because you'll just have a bunch of fired up people who know what really needs to be done and feel responsible to their to their constituents and not responsible to DC. I don't understand how the Democratic Party is confused about this. Like, what? You, a person of color out of nowhere, you know, through a cult of personality and talent taking power? How is that going to be possible? It's like, have you forgot those eight years already? <laughs> like, they're, all, they're into this Clinton model of moderation and going towards the, the center. When you had this, this incredible figure in Barack Obama who totally did not do that, also, for all these claims that whenever there's a discussion of defund the police, moderates lose in, in conservative counties, it's like, that's not why you lose. I mean, AOC talked about in the New York Times, and I think it makes a lot of sense. You lose because you don't know how to use social media. You lose because <laughs> you don't, you're not doing what Obama did with his, you know, campaign, which was groundbreaking in terms of its use of the internet. You're still doing the same old stuff you did 20 years ago, of course you're going to lose. If the Republicans are beating you with technology, that's your fault. Hmm. Okay, listen, uh, Barack Obama, former president of the United States, was recently talking to, I think it was Peter Hamby on a, a Snapchat uh, show, and he is sort of Mr. Moderate. He, he was making comments, uh, some of the comments that he was making about, for example, messaging. He said, listen, you don't if you want to say defund the police, you know what? You're going to get a bunch of people who already agree with your point of view to say rah, rah. And if you just rephrase it as reform the police, you might actually get more people on board for this idea. Well, what's, what's wrong with that notion? Uh, I'll take that one. Branding? This is a branding <laughs> issue? No, I, but Harley, let me, do, let me take it because I feel like it, this is, it's black on black here for a second. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I heard that. I heard Obama say that. I, I do agree that, like, Obama's package was more progressive than his reality. I think he certainly was more moderate and also less than a moderate in some ways. Uh, uh, but I and I when I heard him talk about defund the police, I think the piece that he's missing well, there's two pieces he's missing. One, after you hear the phrase defund the police, you could Google it and find out what it means and what the people who have been representing that phrase for many years say what it means, so you could learn about it. And I think if you if you just get caught up in the in the catchphrase you're no different than people who got caught up in Obama saying hope and change and didn't learn what he meant about it. So first of all, as a guy who knows about snazzy catchphrases misleading people, he should, he should, he should pay more attention. Two, I think the other thing is that we tried reform the police. <laughs> We've tried lots of different ways to say, police, please stop beating us and killing us. Please do a better job in our communities. And it hasn't worked. So of course, black folks were very creative we come up with new ways to say, okay, if you didn't listen to this, now how about listening to this? If you didn't respect the blues, here's hip hop. <laughs> so I think what we're saying is like, we keep trying to say different ways to ask the police to do a better job and they haven't listened. And reform certainly has failed around this country. Every urban environment has a new police chief every six to seven months, it seems like, where there's always a new police chief who's coming in from the last city where they failed to come here to tell you how to do it differently. We, we are way past reform. And I was really bummed out by Obama not actually realizing that reform is an idea that has already failed. And with that, we will never have Barack Obama on our podcast. <laughs> I'm the only black comedian in America who has not met Barack Obama. <laughs> I wonder why. And to be clear, I, I, I like Obama. I love Obama. I respect Obama. Obama did things that I still feel that I still. And when I see him speak, of course, like a lot of people, there's a part of me that just starts to weep and get shaky. So there is a respect and a love for this man. But also, uh, as Ijoma Uluo said in our podcast recently, we still get to criticize these people. Uh, if you continue on to do this, uh, does... Uh, humor get easier, more difficult, stay the same uh, when the administration is slightly more in your favor than the last one? Actually, I think it gets a little bit easier because maybe it's not such desperate, like, like anger. That's how I felt over the last four years with the way that the Trump administration has handled the pandemic. It's like, look, I'm already dealing with a country that's anti-black. I can't do anti-black and anti-science at the same time. So I feel like it actually, the humor becomes more plentiful when the situations 
easier to get to when the situations aren't so dire, but also humor comes from pain. So it's uh, it's it's just a different type of humor. I mean, satire's back. It's so <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Years ago, we were able to give extreme examples of things. Kamau, in your work, you're, what, are you in the fifth season now of um, uh, United Shades of America? Yeah, we just finished our fifth, fifth season, and I'm actually currently filming the sixth season because I am not afraid, apparently. <laughs> United Shades of America has always been a space for difficult conversations. This season, it's more important than ever. What would you say to the now, looking back over these seasons, but what, what stuck out to you? Everybody actually wants the things that Progressive wants, which is like in Progressive, let's just break it down. We want good schools for our kids. We want living wages. We want access to health care, uh, affordable or free, depending upon maybe how much money's in your wallet. We want, we want uh, good streets. We want less people incarcerated. We want a kinder, gentler criminal justice. These are all things everybody wants if you sit down and go, how does this affect your life? And that's what I've learned through United Shades. I've talked to, to gang members on the south side of Chicago. I've talked to ex-coal miners in Appalachia, and they all want the same things. The problem is, is we get distracted by the team sport element of politics, and we've gotten distracted by a ton of misinformation and lies. So I think if you can cut through all the lies and misinformation and the team sport and go, what do you want? We all want the same things. It's just about actually, get, if we all understood that, we would get there a lot quicker. Yeah. You know, Hari, uh, you cranked out a documentary about the uh, Apu from The Simpsons. Apu, a cartoon character voiced by Hank Azaria, a white guy. <laughs> a white guy doing an impression of a white guy making fun of my father. <laughs> and I don't know if you were braced for it, but the kind of vitriol and hatred that you got online, I think anybody that was following your social feeds saw this. Um, what did that do to you for, I mean, this, it seemed for months, and there has been substantive change on the program. Hank Azaria is no longer going to voice uh, Apu's character. The character might not be back. There's other uh, white actors who've said, I'm no longer be, going to be voicing uh, act, uh, you know, uh, characters of color. So there has been some progress made that, that that documentary started the conversation. But as you uh, as you saw the responses, how, how did you make sense of it? Well, it's what I get for giving human beings the benefit of the doubt. Like, it serves me right. I thought we were going to have this documentary and have a conversation thoughtfully about representation and race and you know, this hazing process that all people of color seem to go through throughout the history of America and, you know, uh, you know, where we are as a society now compared to when The Simpsons came out. Instead, it was, you know, death to me. Like, that wasn't part of the documentary. And it serves <laughs> me right. I had this little bit of hope that just perhaps we would have a discussion. We would, ha we would be in a national seminar class just chipping away and contributing to each other's points. And it serves me right. And so, no, I didn't brace for it. I knew there would be some pushback, but not globally, considering the movie was only available in like one or two countries. Um, but it tells you, you know, at the end of the day, the substance does not matter, right? It feels like there's a template for, uh, you know, what you're angry for that this week on the internet. And I got plugged in for, a couple of years and that's yeah. just all yeah not just for a week there's stuff that i want to say about it that hurry maybe wouldn't say or can't say but i've seen it as being his friends the thing i want to say is the show has made changes they have not credited him with any of those changes they have not invited him to the table to say hey you were right in fact al Jean, who is a producer on the simpson has been there since the early days has been has trolled him on twitter a couple times has come after him hank azaria has never reached out to say what you did, though it hurt, it led me to do this. Every time that people talk about Apu leaving The Simpsons, Hurry's name and Doc don't come up. It regularly happens. I see it all the time and it makes me furious. And this is once again, white people trying to get credit for a brown person's work because they act, are acting like we just came to the point of changing this when it is all through him. And I think it's totally despicable on the part of The Simpsons to act like this is some decision they came through because they were enlightened and not because this dude's Doc actually made a difference. I'm not going to comment on that, but I'm definitely not going to disagree with anything he said. <laughs>
<laughs> Hari, we, we, uh, more Haris need friends like Kamau. That's all I got to say to that. That's that was find, find your, everybody should find their Kamau. We, we're pretty good friends. All right, Hari Kundabolu, W Kamau Bell. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, and I'm finding mine. And finally, after a lonely and difficult and deadly nine months, residents in Britain's care homes are once again able to embrace their loved ones after months of physical separation. Couples like Bob and Patricia, who suffer from Alzheimer's, they kissed and hugged through their face masks. And Serena was able to hold her mum tightly for the first time since the pandemic began. This was all made possible thanks to a rapid COVID-19 test that gives results after 30 minutes. A reminder that care home residents and staff are some of the most vulnerable. And when it comes to the vaccine, they will be among the first to get it. The rollout is starting here in the UK next week. And that is it for our program tonight. Remember, you can follow me and the show on Twitter. Thank you for watching Amanpour and Company on PBS and join us again tomorrow night.